This is Vern Benham Grimsley with the Spiritual Renaissance broadcast. In San Francisco, a man on the street pollster asked people this question. If you were rich, what would you do? A Ferris wheel operator replied, I've been working all my life, and so far as I see, there's not going to be much chance of my ever being rich, but I've always worked, and I'd rather be working than just sitting around. I'd be climbing the walls if I didn't have anything to do. A sheet metal worker said, I imagine if I had really a lot of money and didn't have to work or anything, I'd buy me an island someplace, and I'd go there and live. I'd have some friends, girls mainly, about four girls. I'd divide up the island into sections. I'd section off the island and divide my time. An iron worker said I'd go back to Italy and stay in the town where I was born. A claims examiner replied, I don't think that'll ever happen, but if it did, I know what I'd do with my time and my money. I'd work with people, people that needed help, young people, old people. I'd work right in the community. An aeronautics student said, I'd spend my time helping other people, like giving to the needy. Whoever needed it the most, I'd help the blind, the lonely, the mentally retarded. And a computer programmer said, if he were rich, he'd travel. He said, I'd get involved in art and art treasures, collect art and establish schools and museums of art, art that the people could come and see and touch. Well, what would you do if you were rich? What would you do with your life? What are you doing with your life even now? Have you found a purpose for your existence? That is the most vital issue in human experience. The most sweet and fragrant wine, if left to sour, produces the most acid vinegar. And so the greatest of human abilities, unless turned to the doing of good, will sour and yield to evil purposes. Use well what God has given to you. From those to whom much has been given, much shall be required. The same parachute which saves a man's life in the air may drown him in the sea. The identical talent, which will make you great if you use it to serve God, will be your undoing if you employ it selfishly. You are not given what you have capriciously. You must use it well, lest it use you ill. Jesus said, you cannot serve both God and mammon. Mammon was the Aramaic word for money. Jesus also said to seek first the kingdom of God. What you seek second is up to you, but seek first the kingdom of God. If your first loyalty is to God, you then can be trusted with money. But if your first loyalty is to money, nobody can trust you. So Jesus emphasized, get your priorities in order. Spiritual things are the true essentials of living a meaningful and joyous life. One of the universal lessons of all of human history is that men and women whose lives are lived in hatred also live their lives in fear. Consider the ancient tyrant Dionysius, who ruled in cruelty over Syracuse 400 years before the birth of Christ. He was so continually terrified that he might be assassinated because of his wickedness that he always insisted the barbers trim his hair and his beard by holding red-hot coals in metal tongs, thus burning and singeing the hair off his head and face rather than using a razor. Such was his dread that someone might cut his throat. There is an inexorable law of life in this. The sinful person is a fearful person. He flinches at shadows and flees from echoes. Only the man or woman whose life is given to the good knows the joy of the godly and the peace of the righteous. But some people seem interested in hearing about religion only if somebody's attacking it, which is the same attitude one politician had about banjo playing. He said the only time he liked the sound of a banjo was when it was being broken over its owner's head. But most people acquire such a negative attitude toward religion more from their childhood image of religion rather than from the way it really is. Only by personal faith in God can you discover the personal power and joy there is in real religion. Once God becomes a vital influence in your life, nobody will be able to argue or ridicule you out of what you have found because you will have experienced it firsthand. I've spent many long hours through the years talking with young people whose lives were so painful and purposeless that they stood on the very precipice of suicide. Perhaps someone listening to this radio broadcast this moment has felt that way. Perhaps you still do. But let me tell you something that can transform your life if you will but believe it. That life is worth living when you find something worth living for. And God created you for that. God has a plan for this planet and a purpose for your human life. A purpose which can thrill you and fill you with a sense of zest and joy and dynamism you have never experienced before. Jesus said, the truth will make you free. That is, if you will accept it. A sandwich will satisfy your hunger. That is, if 
you will eat it. Truth, like nourishment, must be assimilated into your life in order to work its transformations. If you don't know what it is to live in faith, you don't know what it is to live. You were born and created to find a faith in God, to find God, not merely to find out about God by reading theology books or philosophy, but to find God as your father and your friend, to know God, to walk through the days of your life, of your eternal life, in a vital sense of companionship with the very creator of this universe. Jesus once said these four powerful words, have faith in God, dare to believe that you are a son or daughter of God, that God is your father. Lincoln said, let us have faith that right makes might. Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes wrote, it is faith in something which makes life worth living. And that is truth. But once you have committed yourself to the good, still the question remains, do the ends justify the means? If a man's purpose is a good one, should he ever use evil methods to bring it about? Consider a true example. During the early 1800s, an author named Mason L. Weems wrote a biography of George Washington, which he hoped would inspire young people to improve their characters and hold fast to high ideals. But in it, Weems made up a number of untrue stories about George Washington, including the one about George chopping down the cherry tree and saying he couldn't tell a lie. Historians have found that Weems concocted many fictitious events in the life of Washington in order to inspire young people. But consider, is it right to try to persuade boys and girls to be truthful by telling them a story which you know is in fact an untruth, not only the results of your life, but the ways you accomplish those results are important as well. The means, in fact, determine the ends. For that reason, Jesus said, even your motives must be pure. Jesus condemned not only unjust actions, but unjust thoughts as well. I heard a teenager say he enjoyed having fights and arguments with his girlfriend because it was so much fun making up. Some likewise maintain that humankind can only appreciate peace when it is occasionally interrupted by war. But is occasional sickness necessary for the enjoyment of robust health? Certainly not. Neither are hatred and violence necessary for the appreciation of love and peace. Spiritual values are fulfilling satisfactions in and of themselves. 300 years ago, near the town of Primiero, Italy, the famous castle of Pietra was constructed atop a high, huge rock it stood. But a little over a century ago, the rock suddenly split in two from top to bottom and left the entire castle on top but without any way to reach it from the ground. This, too, is how many view ideals. As castles in the air, looming high and inaccessible above their human capabilities, unable to be attained, and yet ideals are but realities unrealized. And humankind are once again beginning to rediscover some of these ancient insights of the past. The teachings of Jesus, the fatherhood of God, the brotherhood of man are nearly 2,000 years old. But by no means does this invalidate them. Antiquity does not equal inferiority. Scholars say that 12th century Gothic architecture, which was done entirely in stone masonry, without any of the modern devices and tricks of concealing steel beams and girders to strengthen the structure, nevertheless was sturdier than most of our modern steel frame buildings. And some Gothic architecture has stood uncracked for over seven centuries with only minor repairs. Some religious truths may likewise be very old, but they are still quite useful and dependable today, contemporarily, and many of the passing theories and philosophies which people erect today will, like some modern architecture, crumble in 50 years. But the teachings of Jesus will endure. God is eternal, and the experience of knowing God, discovering God, living your life as a son or daughter of God feels at last right. You were born for this. You were created to live in this faith, to know this very simple truth and live it out. If something is real, you can depend on it. You can count on it. You can live your life based on it. And the truth of God's love and God's reality, God's care and concern for every moment of your life and every aspect of you, that is real. By faith, you can know it and experience it. There's joy in this. One afternoon, I visited 
with a recently widowed woman who described all of her life as an ordeal. She kept using that word. Whether washing the floor, cooking a meal, she experienced nothing, she said, but a feeling of dreary drudgery and that it all was an ordeal. I am aware, she said with a sigh, that I am forgetting how to laugh. That is an ominous moment in any life. Psychologists have found that inability to appreciate humor is a sign of oncoming mental disturbance. But the greatest source of joy in life is not in anything external or material, but in the finding of God by faith. On a clear evening from a hilltop, the entire San Francisco Bay is a diamond necklace of lights, exquisitely beautiful. But no one can prove the beauty of that. Neither can these things of the spirit be proved mathematically, but they can be recognized and known within your soul. You can discover and apply these truths experientially in your life and find and know firsthand these things are real. One of the greatest principles Jesus taught is that your life need not remain as it is. You can be transformed. Repentance is the decision to change. If you're driving along a highway in a car with good brakes on dry pavement, 50 miles an hour, and suddenly you see a child out in front of you in your way, your car will travel 55 feet just during the time it takes you to put your foot on the brake pedal, and then another 187 feet to come to a complete stop for a total of 242 feet. Consider a parallel. Once you have developed the momentum of a habit in your life, it too is difficult to stop, which is bad if it's a bad habit, but good in the case of a good one. God consciousness can literally become habitual as a frame of mind in your life, the joyful, awesome awareness of being a child of God, a member in the universal family of God. The English author C.P. Snow once described the sort of courage which makes people great. Not careless courage, he wrote. Courage of the will and conscience. One has been trained to recognize the intolerable. Someone has to put it right. Who more suitable than oneself? If not now, when? End of quote. God needs men and women like that today. People who will dare to pray, your will be done. And who more suitable than I to do it? And if not now, when? There is an urgency to this. For as Jesus declared, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. There is a vital need for a new age of spiritual faith and love and truth on this planet. And you, if you'll commit your life to God, may be part and perhaps a leader in this dawning spiritual renaissance. And then write to us, will you? We really want to hear from you at the Spiritual Renaissance Institute, Box 3080, Oakhurst, California, 93644. I've written Finding God, Getting to Know God, Growing Spiritually, Seven Principles of Prayer, Life After Death, any and all of this literature. Yours free, without cost, charge, or obligation when you write to us. For those of you listening in other countries around the world over our international satellite and shortwave network, let me spell out mailing address, Box 3080, Oakhurst, O-A-K-H-U-R-S-T, California, C-A-L-I-F-O-R-N-I-A, 93644, USA. This is a non-sectarian, non-profit program proclaiming the dawning spiritual renaissance, the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, the worldwide family of God. And so for now, this is Vern Benham Grimsley saying, may God's will be done by you. Good day.